birth of Jesus, according to Luke. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was the governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and expecting a child. While they were there, the time for the baby to be born came, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. This isn't really as nice as the King James, is it? No, no. There's no room for them in the inn. Much nicer. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be the sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had seen and heard, which were just as they had been told. The Lord had his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Amen. Amen. Very familiar passage, right? You could almost recite it from memory, couldn't we? Mm -hmm. Well, today we come to that long-awaited day, the day that we've been preparing ourselves for over the many weeks of Advent. It's a day that the prophets foretold thousands of years ago, the day announced by an angel to Mary and Joseph, the one and only day in all of history where a virgin gave birth and when God became flesh on this earth. On this day, time was forever divided into before his birth and after. Nature was thrown a kilter when a star stopped its movement and stood still over Bethlehem. And humanity was forever changed as all the world was being enrolled in the census. One more entered life to be counted among the people among his people, a baby who was God himself. Surely volumes should have been written to commemorate this magnificent event. World leaders should have come and paid homage to this king. His people should have been clogging those streets in this little town of Bethlehem. And all over Judea, crowds should have gotten together in joyful song and praise. Caravans laden with precious gifts should have found their way to his parents. Their baby should have been cocooned in a layette of the softest wool fitted into a hand-wrought cradle of the finest polished wood. But this baby slipped quietly into life, surrounded by only his poor young parents in a barnyard of animals. Volumes could have been written, but surprisingly, 
in God's own book, only one verse is written. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the end. Volumes could have been written, but instead we have one verse which speaks volumes. Picture the scene. No midwife was present to help Mary bear Christ into the world. She had to do it on her own with Joseph's help and certainly with God's. The rude and makeshift and mundane surroundings of Jesus' birth gives us pause to think how extraordinary those circumstances were. For thousands of years, even from the very beginning of time, the scriptures tell us, God actively carried out his plan of salvation for humanity. We read about it with Noah, through Abraham, through Moses, and the prophets. Jesus' birth was no sudden snap decision or afterthought for God. It was ordained from the beginning of time. It had been foretold for hundreds of years in prophecy. All Israel expected this birth of this Messiah. And Mary and Joseph had been told and they believed that their baby would be the Messiah. So why was Jesus born in such inauspicious circumstances? The answer lies in the words of the angel to the shepherds. This is a sign for us. God humbled himself not only to be born as a human, but almost also in the most humble of human conditions. How many of us were born in a barn? <laughs> None of us, right? God chose this setting of Jesus' birth to be a picture for us that he demonstrated in his own body. He said, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. From his very birth, Jesus modeled the character of a child of the kingdom of heaven for us. Because in true humility, there is true greatness. And when you think about it, greatness and humility are the paradox of Christ's life and death, figured in the scene of his birth. And this one verse written by Luke in the Gospel, capturing this scene, conveys three important details which cast long shadows of humility and greatness over Jesus' life. He wore strips of cloth. He lay in a manger. And there was no place for him in the end. His mother Mary, she had prepared for his birth by bringing with her on this journey to Bethlehem some strips of clean cloth which she would bind around her newborn son's body to keep him warm and secure. Do you remember when your baby was tiny? Those of us who've been blessed with having one. You swaddled that baby up in the blanket. Remember, you wrapped the baby in the blanket, and the baby was so happy because the baby was warm and safe, and the baby was with mother. And this is what Mary did. She wrapped him up. They didn't have fleecy blankets in those days. They had cloth, and they used it in whatever way they could. Some people say that it may have been cloth that was used to wrap up newborn lambs. So she bound these cloths around her newborn son's body to keep him warm and secure. And it was humble, this swaddling cloth. But it was perfect, because it enwrapped the newborn king in a mother's love. Now much later, we're told that Jesus would wear the cloth of greatness, if only for a moment, as the soldiers on Good Friday placed a robe of scarlet, the color of the king, around him, and then beat him before he went to the cross. Mary placed new straw in a humble manger to cradle her newborn son, keeping him warm and dry and protected. The unusual use of a feeding trough now, in those days, it would have been made out of stone. It's not wood, but like we would think of a manger in a regular barn today. It was made out of a piece of stone. 
It wasn't meant to be for an infant. But it also foreshadowed his greatness. For this baby lying in the receptacle for animal food would himself become food for humanity, the bread of eternal life for all who would believe in him. And because his father and mother found no place at the inn, Jesus was born somewhere outside in an area designated for the beasts. This remarkable nursery might have been beneath a canopy of stars in the moon, and perhaps the baby reached his tiny hands upward as if to touch the celestial bodies that he once had created. He didn't belong in a barnyard, and soon he would find that earth itself held no place of belonging for him who made it. You may remember that Jesus would say, foxes have holes and birds have the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And so it was that night, as the well-known carol says, away in a manger, no crib for his bed. The little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. Look again at the birth scene, and you will see what he was destined for. With bands of clean cloth, Mary wrapped and warmed his body. But one day, Joseph of Arimathea, with a clean linen cloth, would wrap his cold body. The hard, cold stone manger on which he lay at his entry into the world pointed to the cold stone tomb in which he would be laid when it was time to leave. There was no place for them in the inn, so they were cast out into a barnyard. The prophet Isaiah wrote of this as if he could see that scene 700 years before it happened. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know my people do not understand. The Messiah came into the world and his people did not know him. During his life, most of his people did not want to know him. And when he died, most of his people utterly rejected him. There was no place for him on earth. And only one verse was written about his birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the end. What a sad story that first Christmas would have been if it ended with that one verse, wouldn't it? But the story doesn't end here because wonderful, marvelous things were to come as love came down from heaven and entered the hearts of the unsuspecting, the undeserving, and the least likely. The inconceivable had been conceived, and the unbelievable would be believed. So God decided he was going to send out a birth announcement. And who do you suppose God chose to tell of this miracle beyond any miracle? King Herod of Judea, the leader of the chosen people? Or, or maybe Caesar Augustus, the most powerful leader in the world? Or maybe a lesser dignitary like Quirinius, the governor of Syria? Though all of these powerful men are, are mentioned in Jesus' birth story, they're all there, the announcement wasn't made to any of them. God sent his angel to the unsuspecting, the undeserving, and the least likely, to some shepherds living in a field near Bethlehem. To shepherds, and they were the lowest of the low, the outcasts of polite society, to a group who were despised as shiftless and dishonest, even thought of as thieves who grazed their flocks on other people's pasture lands. Shepherds who were homeless, physically dirty from living rough, who were viewed as spiritually unclean because of their dirtiness and were separated by their uncleanness from other Jews who saw them as ritually unclean. They were not holy. Cleanliness and holiness were the defining characteristics of Israel. And these virtues were zealously protected by the priests who sought to exclude every form of unholiness. So shepherds would never be welcomed into the temple. They could not bring sacrifices to make atonement for their sins. They were effectively excluded 
from the covenant relationship with God and were regarded as no better than the Gentiles who stood outside the covenant. And yet, you say, what was God thinking? <laughs> it was to these outcasts that God sent his angel to stand before them and let his glory, the light of heaven, shine around them. And to them he gives the good news of great joy. God's news, God was saying, is for all the people, even the outcasts, especially for the outcasts. The Messiah came to save sinners, not the self-righteous. And could there be any more desperate sinners in the world of first century Israel than the shepherds? Not because their sins were so bad as to be unforgivable, but precisely because they knew that there was no way that they could receive forgiveness under the status quo. They could not make atonement in the temple. So they were excluded from the way of forgiveness. Their only hope was for Messiah to come. The shepherds were waiting for a savior because they knew that they couldn't save themselves. God came to the shepherds because they could not come to him. It would seem that in this story we have two kinds of people. We have the Herods and the Caesars and the Quiriniuses of the world, and the Marys and Josephs and the shepherds of this world. But in reality, they're all the same. There was nothing they could do to save themselves. They were every one of them outcasts destined to be cast out of heaven. But Jesus came from heaven to earth for the outcasts for the Marys, for the Josephs, for the shepherds of the world. Jesus came for you and for me. And if we admit it to ourselves, we'll understand why. No matter how good we think we are, no matter how much success we achieve in life, no matter how hard we try, there is nothing we can do to save ourselves from the end that awaits us all. Only Jesus can do that. And though there was no room for Jesus in the inn, he invites us in. His invitation encourages us to be ready in the most humble, even the most humiliating circumstances, for the light of heaven to surround us and invite us in. Earth could not hold Christ. Nor will we be earthbound when heaven's radiance and light <laughs> shine our way with Jesus at our sides. The light of heaven surrounded the humble shepherds and invited them in. And a song then burst forth from the mouth of angels and then from the whole heavenly host. You know what the heavenly host is? It's the army of God. The, so the heavenly soldiers were singing the song of joy. The lowest of the low basked in the light from on high that night. And the humble were lifted up to become those whom God favors. And the fear that passes all human understanding, I'm sorry, the peace that passes all human understanding overcame all fear. This Christmas Day, remember the story and listen for the song of the angels. They will sing to the unsuspecting, to the undeserving, and to the least likely. They will sing of the true meaning of Christmas when the love of heaven came down to earth in the heart of a baby boy. They will sing of a hope to the least likely, a gift for the undeserving, and an invitation to the unsuspecting. They will sing if we listen for you and me. And this is their song. Glory to God in highest heaven. And on earth peace be with all people. For the inconceivable has been conceived. As the unbelievable is believed. Let's pray. 
Lord Jesus, on Christmas we celebrate your birthday. Yet it's we who receive the presents. Your continuing gift to us is your presence, living in us through your Holy Spirit. And as our great high priest, you stand before the throne of God, your Father and ours, interceding for us. There is nothing that we can do to separate us from your love. We honor you, our great King, the anointed Messiah and the King of Kings, the only King who deserves our obedience, because first, last, and always, you love us. You came into life for us. You lived a life like us, and you gave up your life for us so that our love for you can continue forever, along with your love for us. All you ask is that we believe you love us. Lord, look deeply into our hearts this day and know us. For those of us who believe in you, let us believe anew. For those who have not accepted your Christmas gifts, your love, your forgiveness, all of our sins being forgiven, Lord, your grace leading us to eternal life, may they now invite you into their lives. Lord, we lift up this prayer for all those whom we love who don't know you, Lord, who don't know not only what they're missing now, but where they're going. Lord, sound the clarion call in their hearts. Let us, like the shepherds, kneel in our hearts before you, our King. Once a helpless newborn baby resting in a manger, waiting for the time to be right to take up your burden and carry it for all humankind, for each one of us. And Lord, send us out believing, like the shepherds, and sharing with others the great good news of joy. Jesus, you, our Savior, was born on Christmas Day, and you wait to be reborn into the hearts of every man and woman, every girl and boy. Come, Lord Jesus, be born in us today. Glory to God in the highest, and may your peace rest in the hearts of everyone. Amen. Amen. Amen.